All right, hello again, everyone. This is uh, part two of the section where we first learned about the definite integral. Um, so now there's just some properties of the definite integral and then a, a theorem that goes along with it. So this would be pretty quick, actually. A lot of these properties are things that you would expect uh, without really having to uh, think about them. So I didn't really label this, but I guess I would say properties of the definite integral which again, remember, is just area under a curve, right? Um, so for now, we're just going to use pictures. So a lot of these theorems won't be quite as useful until we find our other way to do that. The first one just says you can factor out a constant. So if you see a constant inside integral, uh, just factor it out. Sometimes that makes your area or your picture a little bit easier to draw. So that's all this one says. Um, the next one uh, basically says the integral of a constant, just c, is uh, equal to c times b minus a. Quick real reason why, if I were to draw a constant here for you, let's just call this y equals 4, and we're trying to find the area under the curve from a to b. You can see it's just a rectangle, right? And the height of that rectangle is 4 which is the C, and the width of that rectangle is the B minus A, hence the area is just length times width. Uh, the next one just says you can do exactly what you'd expect to do with adding and subtracting uh, integrals. So F of X plus G of X, you can break them up into two different integrals if you want. Um, again, some of these will be more useful later on. For now, if you're just graphing something and drawing a picture, you probably wouldn't break it up into two, but you could. Um, you're just going to deal with each one separately, uh, which is probably what you would do without even thinking about it. Same thing we do with, with derivatives um, and limits, right? You can just do them do them separately. Uh, the next one is probably the most important one for this section. It says the area under the curve from A to B is equal to the area under the curve from A to C plus the area under the curve from C to B. And I asked a little question there. I said, where does C have to be? It turns out that it doesn't matter where C is, but just kind of a quick little picture here. If we have the area under the curve from A to B, I hope it's quite obvious that that's equal to the area under the curve from A to C plus the area under the curve from C to B. Just adding up those two areas. However, it doesn't matter where C is. C can be outside A and B. Actually, watch. This sometimes confuses people a little bit more. Here's A and B, and here's C. Uh, whoops, and here's C. But notice um, if we find the area under the curve from A to B, which is this area, right, is equal to the area from A to C, which would be all the pink area, plus the integral from C to B. But remember, the integral from C to B is going backwards, so that's going to be a subtraction, right? So remember, this could also be minus the integral from B to C. So it doesn't matter where C is, you can break it up into two. Sometimes it just makes it easier to do some problems. Most of it, we're just gonna manipulate this for you and ask you some uh, questions about them where there's not a lot going on. And then um, the last one here is just basically pretty self-explanatory, I think. It says if one function is bigger than another function, for the entire integral, then its area under the curve is greater than the other area under the curve. I hope that makes a little bit of sense. I'm not even going to bother drawing a picture for that for you. Um, but if the one is always bigger than the other one, then the area under that curve will always be bigger. Okay. So one of the things that they're going to be asked to do is to put things together into one integral, make your life a little bit easier. So this says uh, the integral from 2 to 7 minus the integral from 5 to 7 of f. So they want you to put this into together. You can just straight apply formulas. I like to draw pictures. What I mean by apply formulas is this would be 2 to 7 plus 5 to 7. Remember, I can switch the limits. I can switch the limits and make the sign from negative to positive. And now, um, whoops, sorry about that. <laughs> I guess I should have wrote that the other way, right? I'll get it. Sorry about that. 2 to 7 plus 7 to 5. And then by our uh, one we just did, which was um, this one. Um, a to C, C to B is A to B. So 2 to 7 plus 7 to 5 is just 2 to 5. So that would be putting it into one integral. 
could also just draw a picture. I like pictures. Watch this. We got this little thing. We got two, and we got five, and we got seven. So the first one is two to seven. So if I think about that, that's all that. And then we're going to minus five to seven. So we're going to get that out of there. So we just have a two to five left. Sometimes the pictures are easier, but you can just straight apply the formulas also. All right. So um, you may remember from derivatives, we actually had a mean value theorem for derivatives. The mean value theorem for derivatives said that the slope of the uh, secant line there's, uh, is equal to, there's one tangent line parallel to that secant line. So the slope of the secant line equals the slope of the tangent line. There's actually a mean value theorem for definite integrals also. It's pretty cool. Um, it Basically, I'm going to draw a picture first, and then I'll, I'll write it up for you. Basically says that if you find the area under the curve from A to B of f of x, remember how we've broken this up into rectangles, right? And we what we've tried to do so far is add up rectangles. And Riemann said, hey, let's add up rectangles that make more sense. Um, you know, instead of all circumscribed or all inscribed, he, he changed his widths and he changed his heights to try to make it as close as possible, right? It turns out that there's actually, um, if you pick it right, for every function, you can you can find the exact area of this curve under the curve with one rectangle. So let's just say I pick a height here. I'll pretend that's the height of my rectangle. So we're going to call that C for a second, and then I draw on this rectangle. And then that pink rectangle is equal to the area under the curve. Pretty close. I probably missed a little bit because that one's a little bit higher than that one. But the idea is that for every uh, function, you can actually find one specific value c that gives you the right height that gives you one rectangle that's the exact area of the entire curve and that's all the mean value theorem says so i like to think about it in words first area under curve equals area of one rectangle i'm going to give you a formula here but sometimes the formula is a little bit hard to uh, memorize um, so um, this is the way um, I like to think about it. This is actually the theorem that they give you because I think about it this way. B minus A is the width of the rectangle. F of C is the height of the rectangle. So this circle thing is the area of the rectangle. And then this, of course, is the area under the curve. Okay. So they just rewrite it. This is their uh, theorem. So it says for some point C in the integral from A to B, f of c equals 1 over b minus a times f of x dx, the integral of f x dx. So they just took that b minus a and divided it to the other side uh, as a memorized term. I don't like that quite as much, although that is useful because that has meaning, and we're going to talk about it in just a second. But I like to think about it as area under the curve equals area of the rectangle. That way I don't have to memorize um, a formula. Okay. So it turns out that that uh, f of c uh, right here has some meaning and it's actually it turns out that that's actually the average value of the function so if i were to take a function and graph a function from a to b that if i find that area and divide it by the length of the uh, interval the b minus a so take the area which is f of x dx uh, divide it by b minus a um, divide it by the length that number whatever it is is called the average value of the function so if i think about drawing all these little red lines, they all have some height, right? They all have a function. So I have, pretend there's like 100 of them or a million of them. Technically, there's infinitely many. But if I take them all, all million of them, let's say, and divide by a million, it's going to give me the average, right? The average uh, height of that um, function. So that f of c has some meaning. It's called the average value. So a typical problem would not necessarily be to show the mean value theorem works, although we're going to do that here in just a second. But a typical question in the AP test would be like, find the average value of this function. And you just have to know that's the area under the curve uh, divided by the length of the interval. Okay. So let me do an example problem for that. So there's two different things that they kind of go together because it's all part of the mean value theorem. It says find the average value and then also verify the mean value theorem for f of x equals x squared on 0 to 3. Um, and then at what point does the function take on its average value? That's the actual of verifying the mean value theorem. I'm going to draw a little picture of this for you. 
It's very simple. Y equals X squared. We're going from zero to three. Okay. So remember what the mean value theorem says is that the area of the rectangle equals the area under the curve, right? So the area under the curve is zero to three of X squared, which I'm telling you is nine because we don't have a way to find that right now. So in these problems, you'll probably be given it to you. If you're not given it to you, it means you can find it by drawing a picture. Later on, we'll be able to find these areas also. So that has to equal the area of the rectangle. So what we're going to do is pick some number C. So we're going to call it F of C. That's the height of the rectangle. And we're going to multiply it by three, which is the width of the rectangle. So we're going to get three times F of C equals that nine. So F of C equals three. By the way, this is the average value. <clears throat> the average value is uh, three. Okay. So now we want to verify the mean value theorem though. So we want to find that C is what we want to do right now. Or at what point does the function take on its average value? So we want to find that uh, three. So we're just going to go, let's just go back to my X squared, which is my function, right? Or I guess we could call it C squared at this point and set it equal to that three and C is, you get plus or minus root three, but the minus root three is outside my integral. So that's not really the one I want. So the function takes on its average value at the square root of three. And again, what that means is at this point right here, square root of three, if I were to draw the height of that rectangle, use that as the rectangle that rectangle will have the exact same area as the area under the curve it's a pretty cool theorem it's pretty cool that you can do it with one rectangle we're going to talk more about uh, rectangles in the in the next section so the main um, point of this section was the mean value theorem uh, those little uh, rules and stuff aren't going to be super handy for us they'll be a little bit handy but not, not so much but the mean value theorem is a big theorem and the average value finding an average value um, it's a formula to memorize in some ways right uh, average value right there but also if you just think about it as being the mean value theorem the height the I'm sorry the area of the rectangle equals the area under the curve uh, so that's it for that one